Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Go ahead and take a seat, y'all. Go ahead and take a seat. Hey, you're welcome. Usually we stand up and read the Word of God together, but this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy teaching, okay, before we get into the message. So I'm going to start off this morning by giving us some context for today's passage. Then we're going to read the passage. Then we're going to pray together. And then after that, I'll get into the emphasis of the actual sermon. So as a church, if you haven't been here before, first off, welcome. We've been going through the book of Genesis. And here we're in Genesis chapter 25. In today's text, there are two scenes. So I'm going to be your tour guide. It'll be a simple journey that we go on. Two scenes. We're going to read both of them right now. But the whole message will be on the second scene. In the second scene, we're going to get introduced to Esau and his brother Jacob. They're the two main people, historical people, in the passage that we're going to look at today. So this is scene one. Let's get into it. Genesis 22. As the boys, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac, the father of the boys, loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah, the mother of the boys, loved Jacob. Okay, so those are our two main characters we're going to focus on. We're going to read into scene two, which is the focus of today's message. And I want us specifically to put on some glasses this morning because we're going to focus in on Esau, the oldest brother of the two. He's going to throw away, trade away his birthright. Let's get into scene two. Verse 29. By the way, I love babies in here. I'm not, so if you're uncomfortable, don't be because I'm not. <clears throat> Baby amens are way better than adult amens, by the way. <laughs> Y'all are frozen sometimes. Bless the Lord, hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you have six kids, by the way, six kids. Um, going for a seventh, no big deal. Verse 29, verse 29, scene two. Verse 29, scene two. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, here it is, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but first, deceptive Jacob here, trade me your rights as the firstborn son. So in those days, birthrights were given to the firstborn son of each family. Culturally, this meant that Esau had a birthright that contained both a material and a spiritual blessing. And in Esau's case, the birthright was determining who would inherit, it, who would inherit the promises from God to their great-grandpa, sorry, their grandpa, Abraham. So remember, the promise to Abraham was one of land to become a great nation, Israel. And then lastly, and most importantly, that Messiah would come through the family lineage. In other words, the birthright was a massive and a huge blessing. For Jacob to ask of this would have been unheard of. It would have been comical, especially because he's proposing to his older brother Esau, why don't we just trade? I'll give you soup because you're hungry and exhausted. You give me the birthright. And so think about it. A birthright, right? And which came with land, which came with becoming a great nation, and in which one day in Bennington we would be bragging on your faithfulness because you chose to accept the birthright and the Messiah came through your lineage. Okay, so that versus a bowl of soup. It's just easy decisions. It should be what we're going to read on and see exactly what happens. Verse 32. Look, Esau says, I'm dying of starvation. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Esau does the unthinkable. He compromises. He trades away his blessed birthright. Compromising. Let's pray. God, this is your church. Do your thing. Holy Spirit, wreck people in the best way possible. Speak, O oh Lord. I'm a weak vessel. 
but you're strong. May you speak through my mouth, God, through my mind and in my heart. Right now, God, there be no people-pleasing, performing, any of that, God. You would speak through me, God. And then make us hearers receptive. We're coming in hungry. We want more of you. Increase in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, church, it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day mundane or busy cycles of life. And it causes me, well, I'll confess, to forget about some of the most important things, to forget about living in the presence of God, to forget that I've been blessed with a new identity that can cause me to live differently than before my conversion. And the next thing we end up knowing as we go through the mundane ups and downs, peaks and valleys of life we can find ourselves in is compromising situations. And I suggest that it's because we, we hesitate to slow down, specifically to remember who we are, and even more so, remember whose we are. Sometimes it's good to stand in front of a mirror and remind ourselves who we are. Sometimes it's good to stand in front of the mirror and say, and remind ourselves whose we are. Sometimes we got to look in the mirror some morning and say, I am complete in Christ, who is the head of all principalities, both seen and unseen. The Lord is my shepherd. That is my birthright by faith. I don't need affirmation from so, so, and so, and so. I have affirmation from God, my Father. Amen, church? Sometimes we have to look in the mirror and say, I'm God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for me to do. I'm God's masterpiece. He's given me good works to walk in. I have purpose for each day. My proclivities, my inclinations, my interests, my personality, though it may be condemned, though it may be celebrated, whatever you may land on, it was tailor-made for you to do good works and testify that God doesn't just exist, but he's good. Sometimes we have to look in the mirror and say, I am kept by the power of God. I'm gonna make it. In seasons where I'm getting my butt toe up, I can make it. I will make it. I have the Holy Spirit's power. And I choose to walk in victory. Though I may limp through this season, I will make it. Though I may limp into heaven, I'm going to make it. The power of Christ is within us. Sometimes it's just a beautiful thing to remind ourselves of our blood-bought identity church. I felt it in this room right now. I could feel your faith building. I could feel your confidence in Christ building. And do you know why? Reminding ourselves of our blood-bought identity. It keeps us from making stupid compromises. Right now, the likelihood for us right now to sin against God and compromise is extremely low. If you felt that stirring in your spirit, it is extremely low. And it's because we're being reminded of not just who we are, but whose we are. And the same principle, confidence in identity, confidence period, it lays itself out all throughout life. Daughters will be less likely to go searching for love in the wrong places when they are confident that their daddy loves them. Brides will be way less likely to look for attention outside of their marriage when they're confident that their husband loves them, that they sacrificially will will their good, that they truly believe the best in their husband and vice versa within a marriage. It's amazing the godly natural decisions that we will make when we are confident in our identity. In other words, I'll say it again, we can avoid some dumb decisions like Esau did when we're confident. And holding up in front of us is a mirror of God's word reminding us, actively pursuing the word of God, being reminded every single day of our blood-bought identities. In today's text, Esau sells his birthright. He sells his identity, and he does it for a bowl of soup. Esau ends up selling off his Abrahamic blessing for a bowl of soup. He sells and trades away his eternal blessings for a bowl of soup, and I suggest that he did this 
because he forgot who he was and whose he was. Could you imagine if Esau figuratively looked in the mirror constantly, just had a habit of looking in the mirror and said, I am chosen by God. I have purpose on my life. I was designated firstborn so that I would have the Messiah come through my lineage. I doubt, this is just me, Roy's opinion here, I doubt he would have so likely, so easily given in to compromise. So easily would have given in to doubt. And so, just like Esau, we fall into compromise when we are out of step with our identity in Christ, when we're not actively aware and living out of our identity in Christ. In today's passage, we will see, and we're also going to examine what I'm calling the cycle of compromise. So this is just something that the Holy Spirit gave me as I was reading this passage and seeing a pattern of how the enemy does this within our lives, a cycle of compromise. Esau gets into a compromising situation. It creates then doubt. He then compromises because of the doubt. And then he experiences shame and regret. Uh, sound familiar? I'm too, off, too, too acquainted with that cycle. And this matters because the enemy is using this tactics so easily within our life. So to keep us on the cycle of compromise is why he's doing it. And he wants us to keep away from not only God, but God's people. And I don't know about you, y'all, but I'm just tired of that lifestyle. I'm just tired of constantly compromising my integrity in Christ for bowls of soup. So we're going to get into the text now, all right? We good now? We've read it. We've got the intro. We've got the lenses to see this thing through. And we're going to become familiar with the cycle of compromise. And my hope is, is that we would jump off that thing today. Amen? Let's do it. Verse 29, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. All right. Jacob replied, Trade me your birthrights as the firstborn son. Esau is exhausted. Esau is hungry. Esau is tired. This is also called hangry. And it's a medical condition that many suffer from. That includes myself as well. And out of hangry comes terrible decision making. So just this week, um, me and my bride, we go on weekly date nights. Bless the Lord, it definitely sustains us. And so uh, I had not eaten on purpose throughout the whole day. And so I wanted to really celebrate with my bride when we got together. So we go to the Cheesecake Factory, and as we're sitting down, waiting, I am famished. All I can think about when you're in hangry mode is like you're short-tempered, you want the food, and it's just like, then I will be normal again. So I'm listening, I'm listening, and really it's, I'm listening to half of what my bride's saying, right? And I'm like, I can't wait for this food. And then finally, fi oh, okay, all right, Terry, don't be mocking me. Don't be laughing. At me. Hey, hey, don't be laughing at me. And then when the food finally gets there, right when I was about to dig in, my bride asks a serious, thoughtful question. And I ended up saying this to her. Don't talk to me about work right now. You know I don't like that. Can we talk about something else? I want to enjoy my meal. I'll talk to you about it later. And you could imagine it did not go well with me. Um, it did not go well with me. And so usually I would be easygoing, my hunger, but my hunger ended up compromising, right? Some fruit of the spirit, which is long suffering, which is patience, fill in the blank. I share all of this, not so we can just connect, but to make the point that Esau was in a compromised position when he was exhausted and when he was hungry. Like these aren't just words in a page. This is an actual human who is exhausted and hungry. We can give him a, just a tiny bit of compassion here. And it affected his decision making. This is the first stop on the cycle of compromise. Church, God has made us both physical and spiritual beings. Our inner person is literally connected to our outer appearance, our outer person. So we have to beware of our decision making when we are tired or hungry. 
And I know it's like really simple 101, but this is some straight biblical stuff when it comes to human nature. Interestingly enough, I found this fascinating as the Holy Spirit continued to just press me into some biblical ethics and precedents. The only time in the gospel accounts that Jesus, that it clearly says that Jesus was tempted by the enemy, was during his 40-day fast. When he was exhausted and when he was hungry. He didn't tempt the Son of God, who was truly God and truly man. While he had a full belly and well rested and got two hours of REM sleep and two hours of deep sleep. The enemy knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly that us humans are compromised when we're in physically deprived states. Being both physical beings and spiritual beings. Jesus explains it this way. For the, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Exactly. I don't care how full of the spirit you are after worship, how full of the spirit you are after the word, after seclusion, after time meditating or memorizing the word. We better watch out if we're exhausted and hungry because we are both physical and spiritual beings. And it's much more than just, as we read this, it's just right, it's just a really concentrated incident where Esau is just exhausted. He's famished, and it's all, boom, right there in one moment. But it's not just that. It's actually that and much more. It's the seasons of emotional exhaustion, the week of running around, the day, the day where we haven't eaten much or forgot to eat, the late nights because our kids will not go to sleep, the late nights because our kids are doing things that we can't control or approve. It's in these situations in those type of seasons of life, that we must be aware that we are compromised. And we better be aware because we make decisions regardless of what state we're in. So to have that mindset and be aware that we're connected in body and spirit will help inform us and bring us awareness that we're compromised. That our spirit wants to obey God, but Jesus says our body is, y'all said it earlier, they all said, Jesus said that our spirit is willing, but our body is, there we go church, and it will be in this situation that the enemy will introduce, not, in, not just in Esau's cycle of compromise, but in our cycle of compromise, the next step on the cycle. Let's read on to see. Verse 31, all right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau, and here it is. What good is my birthright to me now? Notice, this is the first time that doubt is introduced into this situation. Esau should be laughing off this proposal from his brother, Jacob. But he doesn't. Remember, it's comical. Jacob's asking Esau to trade away being a part of history. And the, the Messiah of the world would come through his lineage. But instead of laughing it off, we see him instead doubting. Doubting even if that was an actual blessing. Church. The enemy will leverage exhaustion, hunger, us being physically compromised in order to introduce doubt. And doubt is a powerful emotion. It's the antithesis of faith. And it's impossible to please God without faith. It was the enemy's tactic in the garden. When Eve came to doubting the goodness of God, right before she sinned by eating of the tree. And it still works today. We become overwhelmed with grief and begin to doubt God's goodness instead of clinging to our birthright promise in Romans 8. You'll see it up here. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We have flashbacks of past things that we've already repented of 
and we start to think, have I really been forgiven of those things? Instead of looking at Psalm 103 and remembering our birthright. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We willingly sin over and over, no doubt about it, myself included, and we doubt that we will actually make it to heaven. Can a person like me, who's tasted and experienced the goodness of God, then continue to sin, but continue to love God and make efforts and strides, feeling like I'm caught between both worlds, and I can actually get into heaven? And it's at that moment, we need to look in the mirror and be reminded of John 10. And what Jesus said to those who follow him, I, meaning Jesus, give them life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from my hand. Could you imagine if Esau would have looked in the mirror once in a while and said, I'm chosen by God. I know who I am. I know who I belong to. I doubt, again, that he would have so easily fallen in to doubt and compromised. And the enemy used the doubt in order to bring about compromise. Let's read on to see this. Verse 33, but Jacob said, first you must swear your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Esau officially trades his birthright away. The deal is done. He compromises and he gave in because of doubt, which was preceded by exhaustion, spiritually, physically. So let's read on to see the effects of the compromise. This will be the last part of the cycle of compromise. Verse 34. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then he got up and he left. Esau showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. What a sad scene. We see conflict between brothers, a fast-paced interaction, an exhausted, compromising Esau, conflicted about what to do and questioning, and then Just like that, the scene ends. And we see Esau just sitting there with his bowl of stew. And then the text says simply he just got up and left. There's no recording of Esau saying, that was worth it. Oh, Lord, that was worth it. Trading off my birthrights for a temporary satisfaction was worth it. We don't see him say that at all. We don't see him say, that was a delicious meal. There's none of that. Instead, it's a quick read of him eating, leaving, and showing contempt for his birthright. Church compromise is short lasting and not fulfilling. You're going to see a quote up here I want us to read from. It's one that I find fascinating. Compromise will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Compromise will take you farther than where you want to go, keep you longer than where you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And what we then end up are uh, are left with is shame and regret. The text says that Esau ate, pushed away from the table, and then showed contempt for his birthrights. The ESV says that he despised his birthrights as firstborn, meaning he hated it. He got to a place of hating his birthright. Why? Shame and regret. I think, Roy here, thinking out loud, I think he ate the bowl of soup, realized he made a mistake, and hated himself for it. So then instead of admitting and humbling himself that he messed up, he points the blame at the birthright, which put him in the whole situation of compromise. Mm. Church, sometimes we may find ourselves in this similar compromising situation. And then God will decrease his favorable hand on our life. 
We will then justify, rationalize, point the finger at God or other situations or the situation or our blessed birthright. And then we'll become bitter towards God instead of what he was trying to get us to do. Humble ourselves. Humble our pride. Repent, meaning turn away from our sin and face God again. Saying, here I am, God, in submission to you once again, despite my sin. Shame and regret are a powerful tool of the enemy to keep us away from God and away from his people. In Genesis 3, God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of knowledge, but they disobeyed and they experienced shame after. I'm going to read this briefly. Genesis 3 here. So she, meaning Eve, took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and here it is. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. And here it is again. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Church, shame and regret will cause us always to hide from God. And I'm talking about the God who gave us a new birth. The God who gave us companionship when we were lonely, hope when we were hopelessness. The God who gave rest to our souls when all we knew was anxiety. The God who gave us a spiritual rebirth, a new identity, and wrote our name in heaven. That God. Shame, regret will cause us to run away from that beautiful God in which we initially came to salvation because he was amazing and merciful. So if you wouldn't mind just indulging me for a few more moments, just a few, to brag on Jesus, pull back from the text and make us aware of how good God is. Jesus was tempted to throw away his birthright, literally just like Esau, in the last hours of his life. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. He became so exhausted thinking about his oncoming, incoming, crucifixion, death, and suffering. And he was so exhausted thinking that, that the text actually says that he was close to quitting. And I don't mean to be heretical here, but that's what the text says. I'm going to read it. We don't have it on the slide, and you can hear it. Jesus speaking here. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death, Jesus says. Stay here, speaking to his disciples, and keep watch with me. He, meaning Jesus, went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, and the, that the awful hour awaiting him, which was his Coming, crucifixion, flogging, mocking, would pass him by. In his humanity, he prays this. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Amen. And then he he asked this question. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. We see a moment of weakness close to quitting from our Messiah, but we don't see him give in like Esau. Yet, Jesus says, I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus was tempted to throw away his birthright like Esau did, his birthright to die for a ransom for many so that Roy and his crew of kids and his beautiful bride one day would come to salvation so that your story would be rewritten. That's the purpose of which he intended to come. But instead of seeing, meaning Jesus, Jesus seeing his birthright in that moment as a burden, like Esau did, he saw it as a blessing. And he ends up saying, yet I want your will, Father God, to be done not my own, and because Jesus didn't trade away his birthright, we have been born again, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Church, Jesus lived out of his identity in that moment, actually every moment during his 
three years of ministry. He lived out of his identity as a son of God. He lived to do the will of the one who sent him. Let's live out of that identity in him as well. It's a beautiful picture, a beautiful identity from dark to light. Being a child, regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our broken family background, of our whole family background, of our non-religious background, of our religious background, that we have an identity that is secure, saved, and sanctified. Imagine if Esau stood in a mirror once in a while and reminded himself of who he is and whose he is. Church, let's be men and women who genuinely look in the mirror once in a while and say, not today, Satan. I know who I am. I know whose I am. Get behind me. I want to get real, real practical with you. Sermons are sexy. And then there's a real practical part I'm asking you to participate in. Can you get out your phone, please? Scott, don't act like you don't have your phone on you, dog. Get out your phone for me, please. So as you get out your phone, can you open up Safari for me? Or if you don't have Safari, your web browser. I want you to put in clb.church. Just give me a holler if someone's made it there. Okay. Click on the two lines on the top right corner. Drop down menu will come about. Click on groups, please. Click on spiritual habits, bless the Lord. Scroll down, click on remembering your identity in Christ. Holler at me if you see that list come down. Yeah? Hey church, a mentor of ours put together this list and said, read these to operate out of your identity in Christ. I have organized these so that you can read and get it right in front of you. So this is all, if you have bowed the knee to Jesus, this is all of your blood-bought identity. Sometimes you need that thing concentrated. Sometimes you just need a list to read. My encouragement to you, as we've done on staff, not to brag on us, but to brag on Christ, is to use these any time you want to spend time with God. To read these out loud. You don't have to go through the whole list, but genuinely just to read them and be blessed by soaking in them. <clears throat> For the friend of ours who hasn't quite yet bowed the knee to Jesus, if you've never truly surrendered your life to God, this blood-bought identity which we've discussed today is available today by faith. You can't earn it. You genuinely exercise faith in putting your trust in God. Some things that the Bible says about what it looks like to get the identity blood bought from Christ are a few things. You have to have experienced a sorrow for your sins against God, that you've offended him even though you've noticed his pursuit of you all your life. You must then willingly turn away from running your life and face God. Then you must bow the knee and say, God, I surrender all of my will and my life to you. I'm going to give you an opportunity, friend, if you've never done that, to do that today. I'm going to pray. I want you to listen carefully. I want you to track along. And here's the thing. I don't want you to repeat after me. 
when I'm praying, if your heart resonates with anything from this prayer, if all of these things resonate, if you're saying, yes, that's me, God, then I have something to tell you after we pray. Okay, so everyone, bow your heads with me, please. Let's close our eyes. So if you haven't given your life to Jesus, I just want you to listen in. If any of this resonates, we'll talk a little bit after. God, I have offended you. I recognize you've been pursuing me. You came, died, and raised from the grave in pursuit of me. I recognize I have run from you. I'm sorry. I recognize that I have thought I've known better than you. I'm sorry. I want you. I don't care what this means for my future. I want you. Please forgive me of my offenses towards you. I want you. Please give me a new heart and fill it with you. Now, with everyone's eyes still remaining closed, for the person who's never bowed their knee to Jesus, if that prayer was the attitude of your heart, you are ready to give your life to Jesus. The time's now. It's actually what your life has been building up to. And I'm going to pray it again, line by line, if you've never truly bowed your knee to Jesus. When I stop, I want you to repeat it silently in your thoughts or out loud after each line. So everyone is gonna still have their head down, eyes closed, let's pray again. God, I have offended you. I recognize you've been pursuing me. You came, died, and raised from the grave in pursuit of me. I recognize I've run from you. I'm sorry. I recognize that I've thought I've known better than you. I'm sorry. I want you. I don't care what this means for my future. I want you. Please forgive me of my offenses toward you. I want you. Please give me a new heart and fill it with you. Friend, if you prayed that prayer and meant it for the very first time, would you mind looking up at me? I'd like to welcome you to the family of God. life truly begins your name's now written in heaven your purpose will be revealed never could have imagined actually you may have already imagined it but it'll blow it out of the water you're now back with your creator dog life truly begins now June 4th the father you're gonna be the family you're gonna have it's going to be extremely different than the route it was going. After this, let's connect. I got a present for you, dog. Jesus, thank you so much for my brother, who now is a part of your family, sealed with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.